Okay, in this example, we're told we have water being pumped from a lower reservoir down here, up through this pipe, through a pump, and into an upper reservoir here. And uh, we're given some information about the pipe diameter. It's six inches in diameter. Total pipe length is 200 feet. We have an entrance loss here with a loss coefficient of 0.5. There's one elbow here, loss coefficient of 1.5. And then there's an exit loss because as fluid leaves the pipe, it mixes into this tank and eventually comes to rest. So you have an exit loss of one here. We're also told some information about the pump. Uh, so we're told the performance characteristics are shown here. So we have the head curve here. So this is the head rise in feet as a function of volumetric flow rate here in gallons per minute. So there's the head curve. And then this is the efficiency curve corresponding to it. And we're asked, you know, with this pump, what would be the flow rate between the two tanks? And then do we think this pump would be a good choice for this particular application? Okay, so let's address the first question. What's the flow rate between the two tanks? The way we'll find this is we're going to find the system curve using the, using the extended Bernoulli equation to find out what head rise is required from the pump to get a certain flow rate through the pipe. So that's called the system curve. And then we'll also see uh, from this plot, this is the head rise the pump can provide for the given flow rate. And then we'll see where the system curve intersects this pump curve, and then that will be our, our operating flow rate. The idea is the system requires a certain head rise to give a particular flow rate, and the pump can provide a certain head rise as a function of flow rate. And so we'll see where the two exactly balance. So in order to find the system curve, what we'll do is we'll apply the extended Bernoulli equation from a point one here to a point two there. There's some streamline that goes between those. And uh, let's go ahead and write out the extended Bernoulli equation. I picked those two points in particular because I know a lot of information about them. I know, for example, I know the pressure at point one and the pressure at two are both atmospheric pressure. I also know the velocity at one and the velocity at two are about equal to one another. They're both roughly equal to zero because they're large reservoirs, we're assuming. I also know the elevation difference. So Z2 minus Z1 is 10 feet, right? Because we have that right here. So here's Z1, here's Z2. So the difference is 10 feet. Uh, the head loss term between those two points, it'll be the sum of all the losses major and minor losses occurring between the two points. So this is uh, the loss coefficient, the velocity head where that loss occurs, and this will include all of our major and minor losses. So we have the major loss, which the loss coefficient for the major loss is the friction factor times L over D. And that'll be multiplied by the velocity head based on the velocity in the pipe. So we're gonna base it on this the velocity in the pipe here. I'll call it V sub P. And then we have our minor losses. We have an entrance, we have an elbow, we have an exit. And those all have the same velocity head. It's just the velocity, based on the velocity in the pipe. Okay, because we have the entrance, elbow, and exit. Now these minor losses are probably small compared to the major loss because this is 200 feet in diameter. I don't know for sure offhand, but I, I would suspect that with this length of pipe, the major loss would, would be larger than the minor loss. But since we have all the information, we might as well include it. Lastly, we have the shaft head term. That's what we're trying to find for the system curve. What we're trying to find is what shaft head needs to be provided to the fluid in order for the fluid to operate at a certain velocity in the pipe or flow rate in the pipe. I, sh I should also just kind of uh, comment on that as well. The velocity in the pipe is related to the volumetric flow rate divided by the diameter, I'm sorry, the cross-sectional area of the pipe here. So I could go ahead and uh, substitute this in up in here and put everything in terms of flow rate. Okay, so uh, let me give myself a little extra space here. Okay, so if I uh, substitute everything in here, it'll, I'll get the following expression. 
let me just write this down. It's just going to take a moment to get everything written. Okay, so this is what we get when we rearrange the extended Bernoulli equation. So I've just taken that expression, I've rearranged it here. So this is the elevation head term. And here's our major loss, minor losses. And then for this expression, this is just, uh, you know, the V uh, and the pipe squared divided by 2G. But I've substituted in in terms of the volumetric flow rate. So you can see this expression has the form HS is, is some constant plus another constant volumetric flow rate squared, right? That's roughly what it looks like. By the way, I should uh, just make one other comment here about the... The friction factor. Okay, so we're told in the problem statement that the friction factor can be assumed to be constant and equal to 0 0.02. So I should have probably made a note of that up here. All right, so our friction factor here is just a constant. So that's why I can write this in this form. Now the friction factor may, and it, if if you're dealing with a large enough Reynolds number in the pipe flow. Recall that from the Moody plot, here's a friction factor versus Reynolds number. Here's the relative roughness. So in the Moody plot, you had uh, curves that look something like this. So there's this kind of dashed line here. Everything out in this region up here is roughly independent of the, of the Reynolds number. We call this the fully turbulent zone or wholly rough zone or some kind of phrase like that. But basically what it means is that the friction factor no longer depends on the Reynolds number. It only depends on the relative roughness. So if we have a large enough Reynolds number so that we're in this region, then the friction factor would still be a constant in terms of flow rate. It, it wouldn't depend on the flow rate. It only depends on the relative roughness. So this expression would still hold. If we were in this range where the, the friction factor does depend on the Reynolds number, then it's not quite like this, it'd be a more complicated function of Q, but it's, it, um, it wouldn't deviate too far from Q squared. But anyway, for this problem, you can see that this is kind of a parabolic shape. And we could easily calculate C1 and C2 given the values for Z2 and, and Z1 and uh, the diameter and gravity, et cetera, and all these various quantities. Okay, so in, in fact, if you plug those numbers in, you get an expression that looks like this. It'll be 10 feet, we already said that was the elevation head, plus four, uh, let, me, let me say this a little differently. Sorry, it'll be uh, 10, I'm gonna erase that and write it a little differently. It'll be 10 plus 2.25 times 10 to the minus five Q squared, and that'll all be in feet and then here the Q, it should be in terms of gallons per minute. So this expression here, the 10 and the, the 2.25 times 10 to the minus 5, the, there's some unit conversions that were included, particularly in this 2.25 uh, times 10 to the minus 5, such that I should use, if I use gallons per minute here, then I get that expression. Okay, so. Uh, I guess to be a little more careful, let me just write it out. It'd be like 10 feet plus 2.25 times 10 to the minus 5 feet all over gallons per minute squared times Q squared. So that's what my expression looks like. So that if I use gallons per minute for Q, then those will cancel out and I'm left with feet here and feet there. Okay, so there's some unit convert. When I plugged in values up in here, I did some unit conversions that left me with this kind of expression. But nevertheless, it still looks like this kind of quadratic curve, okay? So that's, the way to read this is, if I wanna operate at that flow rate, this is the head rise I need from my pump, okay? So this is what we call the system curve. It's found using the extended Bernoulli equation. Now to find the operating point, what we do is we, we see um, 
we see the intersection of the pump curve. So this one's the pump curve. And we see where that will intersect with the system curve. Now, I'm just going to sketch it on here just for, uh, you know, just, just to show it graphically. But um, I believe it looks something like this. I know it looks like a quadratic, and I, I believe it's going to cross somewhere right about in here. This is, this is our system curve. So what I've, what I've drawn here, that curve is this expression right here. Okay, so I've, I've kind of sketched it out um, here, but you know I, what I did is I actually used uh, some software to plot it out, plotted these points. I just picked some points off of this curve, plotted them, and this that's kind of where it looks like it crosses. So this will be our operating point right about there. Okay, so our operating flow rate is about 1,600 gallons per minute. So that's where we'll operate. And then the, the head rise corresponding to that, uh, you, you could calculate it, but it, it's roughly about, uh, I think it was 67 feet. That's the head rise. So again, just a reminder, at that point, what it's saying is that our system needs this amount of head rise for the given flow rate. So if we want to operate at 1,200 gallons per minute, I need about, you know, what is that, 35 feet of head from my pump. Okay. Now what the pump curve is, is this is the, the head rise the pump can provide at that given flow rate. So again, if I went to 20, uh, 1,200 gallons per minute, the pump will provide about 75 feet of head at that flow rate. So it's m more of a head rise than what the system really needs to operate at that point. And so the, if, if the pump, if we were at 1,200 gallons per minute, the pump would give more head rise than what we need and it'll cause the flow to speed up. And then what'll happen is it'll eventually, the flow will go to the 1,600 gallons per minute. And then that pump will provide exactly the amount of head rise that the system needs at that flow rate. So that's our operating point. Now, if you look at the efficiency corresponding to that, so uh, I guess maybe I should stop for a moment and just talk about this. So with this pump, what would the flow rate be between the tanks? We just found that. Would this be a good choice for a pump? So the way I'll base that is I'll just look at the efficiency, go to the efficiency curve for that flow rate. And when I go over and read the number off for that, the efficiency is about 84%. That's not too far from our best efficiency point. Our best efficiency point is right there, right? And that efficiency, I don't know what it is exactly, but it, maybe it looks like it's about 90%, right? So our, our operating efficiency, you know, the efficiency at our operating point is pretty close to the best efficiency point. So I would say, yeah, this is a, this is a decent choice of a pump. We're operating at its close to its most efficient point. If that's our only uh, factor that we're going to consider, then I would say this is a good pump that, to be using for this particular application because, again, the efficiency is pretty close to the best efficiency point. All right, so um, one other thing that we might want to know is what's the power required to operate this pump? Now that we know the efficiency and the head rise and the flow rate, how much power do we have to put into the pump? So the way we can do that is we can say, okay, here's the here's the power that gets into the fluid based on, actually, let me rewrite this a little differently. We know the head rise is related to the shaft power in the following way, right? So I could rearrange this to find the power. So that's the, um, this is the power that gets into the fluid uh, density of the fluid, volumetric flow rate, which we just calculated, gravitational acceleration, and then this is the head rise that gets into the fluid. That's this H that we found right up here, 67 feet. And if I want to find the power that we need to put into the pump, what that's going to be is the power that we put into the fluid divided by the efficiency of the pump, right? Because the pump's not 100% efficient, we have to put a little extra power into it in order to get the power we need into the fluid. So 
we can calculate this, right, because we know each of these values. There's a, some unit conversions you have to go through, but when you work it all out, the power that you have to put into the pump comes out to be about 32 horsepower. Probably one of the hardest things in this problem is just unit conversions. Knowing how to do the unit conversions up in here to get this in the proper form, and then doing the unit conversions here to get this into horsepower. Those, uh, those unit conversions can be a pain, but given enough time, and it, it, if you're careful enough, you should be able to figure those out. Okay, so the, anyway, this is the, the end of this example. It was a, a good example of trying to find the operating point for a pump in a pipe system. The really the, the key piece of information is knowing that the operating point occurs where you have the intersection of the system curve and the pump curve because where that intersection is, it's, it's where the head rise we need to operate at a certain flow rate for our system is exactly balanced by the head rise provided by the pump at that flow rate. Okay, and then the second part, is this pump a good choice? Basically, that just came down to seeing whether our efficiency that we're operating at is close to the best efficiency point. If we weren't close to the best efficiency point, we could still operate the pump, it just wouldn't be very efficient. Maybe there's a better choice of pump out there. Okay, anyway, we'll end the example there.